Hi friends, thank you for tuning in to the Concussion Coach Podcast. I'm Bethany Lewis, the Concussion Coach. I'm a neurological occupational therapist and certified life coach, and I specialize in guiding people through their concussion recovery journey. I am passionate about helping people understand their injury, speed up their recovery, and reclaim control over their life post-concussion. The purpose of this podcast is to help increase awareness of concussions and the impact they can have on a person's life, and to bring hope to people who have suffered a concussion and those who love them. I firmly believe that sharing stories and knowledge about concussions will bring important light and understanding to this misunderstood and often invisible injury. The information in this podcast is meant to bring that awareness and hope and is not meant as medical advice. The opinions shared are those of the interviewees and my own. If you are suffering with lingering concussion symptoms, I have created a concussion coaching program specifically for you. I will be your mentor to guide you through your recovery journey, offering help with understanding and managing your symptoms, setting achievable goals, and learning how to manage your own thoughts and nervous system in order to get control over your life again. If this program sounds like something that would help you or someone you love, sign up for a free consultation. In the consultation, you'll get valuable information and resources and gain hope for your future. Sign up for your free consultation at the link in the show notes or at my website, www.theconcussioncoach.com. Hi, friends. Welcome back to the Concussion Coach Podcast. Today, I get to chat with my friend and colleague, Katie Robertson. Katie is an occupational therapist at Cognitive FX as well, and I am excited to get her insights and ideas out here on the podcast. Katie received her master's degree in occupational therapy from the University of Utah and has been a practicing OT for the last 18 years. She has 11 years of experience in acute rehab as well as neural rehabilitation. She has evaluated and treated patients with neurological impairments, including TPI, concussion, spinal cord injury, ALS, MS, brain tumors, stroke, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and anoxic brain injuries. Katie is most interested in learning how to best treat those with brain injuries and help them to return to a more functional and independent life. Seven years ago, she started working for Cognitive FX, the premier center for concussion treatment, as a neuroocupational therapist. Katie is the founder and creator of MindSpark, an at-home concussion therapy tool. So, yay, Katie, thank you for being here. (laughs) You're welcome. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, me too. I'm excited to get good quality information out for people <laughs> and, yeah. and hopefully some hope as well. So let's, I know we had a good bio there, some good information and background, but let's hear a little bit more. What did you, like what got you into occupational therapy and specifically into concussion treatment? Um, More like with occupational therapy, I feel like I knew I just needed to work with people. Like I'm a people person, you know, and I obviously love, you know, more one-on-one interaction. So I knew like working with patients and also just like seeing progress, you know, like when I first started kind of the volunteer hours for OT, it was like, oh, look, like these people are making progress. Someone who came, you know, like out of a coma and then you saw them like, you know, a month later and they were out walking and, and functioning and just, just the, the miracle that happens between like someone having an accident and then like, you know, several months later, seeing them improve so much mm-hmm. was just, to me, that was like what I think stuck the most when I was like, okay, I need to do something like this. I need, I need to do healthcare. I loved, you know, seeing the rehab process. And that's kind of how I got more drawn towards OT. And then also with OT, there's like, there's more function with OT. I, I see, because I was kind of going back for it between PT and OT in, initially. And I was like, I see more function in OT. And it, it seemed more fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the therapy process seemed a lot more fun to me. And so I wasn't just naturally drawn that direction with OT. But then when I started working with concussion or with uh, brain injuries, it was more like in the hospital setting. Okay. That I, when I first started, I graduated and I worked, you know, in a neural rehab clinic. So I saw a lot of inpatient. I saw a lot of acute, you know, head injuries and, and spinal cord injuries and, you know, multi-trauma, that kind of thing. And so... I've pretty much seen a lot of, as far as neurological patients, like that was a whole bunch of just different uh, diagnoses, different types of patients. And that was exciting to me. Like I liked that, like diversity of of seeing one patient and being able to, to help them in a different way than maybe the next patient, right? Because they are so individual. So every person needs something slightly different. It is, it is so cool to see, like there's, there are definitely commonalities and similarities between people and like these general diagnoses, but, but every person is so unique and their, their individual personality and the things that they're, you know, their history that they're bringing into this recovery process, everything is just so individualized. And that does, I love that part too. It is so it's fun that the people person part of us <laughs> that like wants to connect with people and then like 
figure out how to help people. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. 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 Yep. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> this is why we're in the same profession. So this is good. <laughs> exactly. This is why we're talking right now. Um, and how we both ended up at CFX. So tell me, like, how did you end up at CFX? What, what brought you there? Actually, so I, I worked with uh, Dr. Fong, the owner of Cognitive FX, and I worked with her in the rehab. So she was actually doing like, I think her fellowship there or internship, I'm not sure what they call it for neuroscience or neuropsychology. I apologize. And so she worked there for a while. And then she started up this concussion thing. And I really hadn't heard too much about it. I'd heard little snippets and I always thought it was pretty cool what she was kind of starting up, but she had kind of left the hospital. And then she, she ended up calling me up out of nowhere. And it was kind of towards the end, like I had worked, you know, 11 to 12 years in the hospital. And I was like, I'm like, I don't know, a change might be good. So she's like, please, please come over. We're starting this amazing program and we're helping patients with concussions. And and I had worked with traumatic brain injury, right? But we I've kind of worked on the other end where they're very severe TBIs mm-hmm. and then moderate, you know, and then and then they would discharge. And so I, I didn't get to see a lot of, you know, the mild traumatic brain injury or concussions as much. Um, I would see them when they kind of come back for outpatient therapies a little bit, but that was kind of like more of an outpatient setting. And so she called and just, she said, Hey, come check out this. And I, you know, I came and I would, I did a little bit of home help on the side because they were still kind of building their numbers. And, and actually I think I met, you, you were working at the same time, right? The, yeah, yeah. So I, you were doing the couple hours and then there were a couple other OTs that were there as well. Nate. And so I don't know, it was just exciting, like watching you and then also watching Nate both. I just got excited about it. And I was like, this is, this is more what I want to start doing. And so I I actually left my job and I started uh, working at Cognitive FX. So that is awesome. And I think that, yeah, I'm glad you're there. I'm glad you're here with us. It was, it is so fun. And I feel very passionate about what we get to do there. So I'm excited to share with people a little bit about some of the things that we do. So as you did, you made it sound like you hadn't had a ton of experience with concussions prior to working at CFX. Is that right? You've done a lot um, of the logical stuff. And yeah. Cause I was more of an inpatient therapist. So I, I saw more of just like the moderate to severe brain injuries. Okay. So what surprised you or what, how was that different? How is working with concussions different than working with the more severe and and moderate brain injuries? Oh, I think the difference would probably be one. I mean, obviously they're able to be in an outpatient setting. So patients with concussions can walk and some of them, obviously there's, there's a variety of, of difference, but for the most part, they could, it also, like the thing, I think the thing that was interesting to me is that like, they would come in and they would say, okay, it's almost like this is like invisible. Like I'm in, like my disease or this, this injury is invisible to people. So they looked, you know, mm-hmm. normal. <laughs> if, if you say whatever normal is right in this world, but <laughs> they looked as if they could function. Right. And I think p- people thought they could, but then when I dove deeper, you know, mm-hmm. you actually sit down and you talk to them and you listen to the problems that they have and you listen to the symptoms and how it's affected their lives. So, so greatly, yeah. like a huge impact. Then it, like for me, it was that huge surprise because I'm like, wow, this person looks mm. like they're doing okay. They're probably be putting on a good face for people, right? Which yep. most people with concussions tend to do because they want to appear that way also. But they would also just tell me like, hey, nobody knows what I'm feeling. Like they can't see it. It's not like this is a huge cut on my arm that's you get to see the healing process. And I think that was my biggest I guess, surprise or difference was because it wasn't as noticeable as, you know, someone laying in a a bed at the hospital with, you know, all these, you know, incisions and trauma, like broken arms, legs, like they were in that healing process where people I feel like are very much, they draw to that person because they want to help them. But then you have someone walking around that looks right, appears to be uh, functioning well. And in most cases, they weren't at all. Yeah. And that to me was like the big difference. I don't know if that was similar to some of the things you noticed as well, but. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't had a ton of experience with on the the moderate and severe traumatic brain injury side, but the little that I did, you're right. There is more, there's more physical symptoms. There's maybe some, yeah, like uh, tremors or (laughs) like contractions. Uh Um, 
So yeah, like things that make make it more a little bit more obvious to to the outside observer that they're dealing with something. But yeah, exactly. And that's something that when I when I first started working there, I was so surprised we didn't I don't remember we probably learned a little bit about concussions in school, but we didn't have a lot of training, nothing like what I learned once I started working at CFX. And I think that's not uncommon for our profession or most professions, even healthcare, like all the healthcare professions, we don't get a ton of specific information about concussions. And so, yeah, that like, I I did not ever realize how impactful a concussion could be. It it literally could turn someone's world upside down and nobody would know about it because yeah, they can put on a good face for a little while and then they're in bed for two days (laughs) or they, you know, like, yeah, there's, or they're, they're responding. They're really irritable and like emotionally <laughs> responding to things more quickly than they would otherwise. And and if you don't see a physical thing to give you a clue as to that something might be going on for them, then people just assume like, oh, you're just a jerk. <laughs> or you're like, why are you so rude to me all of a sudden? But like they're dealing with so much that is under the surface that people can't see. So exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what are some of the most common? concerns that you see in patients coming through the patient, through the clinic? The common symptoms, I, I feel like the ones that kind of stick out, I think brain fog is a huge one. Mm-hmm. Obviously, headaches seems like a bigger one up there as well. Some vestibular problems and vision problems. The, the interesting thing is like some people, and you've probably experienced this, where they feel like their vision is actually fine. Yes. And then they they learn, oh, it's not. <laughs> You know, I didn't, they come here and they're like, uh, I didn't realize that was so difficult or that I would have, you know, that my eyes were moving together or that they were jumpy. Like, because I mean, we only really look at acuity, right? Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, can you, can I see from here to here? Can I see the, the snail chart? Can I, they can do that. And they're like, oh, I'm pretty good vision wise. And so then they would start to learn through the process. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like I didn't realize when I was reading that I was kind of jumping a little bit or how fatigued I got after I read or my inability to comprehend what was happening in the previous paragraph above, right? I didn't think that had anything to do with vision. And so I would say probably those top four. I mean, can you think of another one that would be like, they they come in a lot for? Yeah, those are are some of the main ones. Um, I think some of the ones that are surprising to people that they don't necessarily realize can be associated with concussion um like the you mentioned the vestibular piece as well like that balance a lot of times people don't don't realize that their balance is as bad as it is <laughs> like they can they can walk it some people can't some people it's it's very obvious that and they they know it but a lot of people um that underlying system the vision the vestibular system those are off to the point where you can still function mostly, but it's taking a lot out of you. Like you said, you're getting really fatigued. You don't even realize that that's related, that the headaches are related to to doing just normal things. But then when you like do balance tests, they are very surprised at how challenging they are for them. But then there are other things that I think are less known that can definitely be related to a concussion that people don't realize, like the anxiety and depression, that irritability piece, you know, those kind of emotional and personality changes, as well as yeah, the the reading, like just those functional things that play in that you don't even really understand why it's happening. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. The word finding that aphasia, uh-huh. right? Like the yeah, sleep problems. There's just so much. <laughs> the, the the digestive issues, that was one that surprised me. Like like people I, I would have never coming into this, like thought, hey, having a concussion would affect the way you your you digest your food. <laughs> Like, it's just not something or like having, you know, even like constipation issues or diarrhea. Like, I feel like those were things that I was like, I would not attribute that to a concussion, but it is very much. It's it's that, you know, fight and fly and rest and digest mm-hmm. that the parasympathetic nervous system that it's like, oh, of course it's going to affect that. But you just, you just never like there's, there has actually been a lot of very surprising things for me just in like the seven years that I've worked there first, I'm like, Oh, I don't think that's part of concussion. I'm like, but then why not? I mean, (laughs) let's really look at it. It started right when their concussion happened, you know, and they've been, they've been dealing with this. Like, and that, I think that's why I like working at cognitive FX is because it's like, why not? Let's look at it. Let's don't just push it away and say, well, that doesn't, 
that's not what's normal for a concussion, right? Because I feel like we don't know what's normal. There are right. so many different symptoms that it's like, you know, and and even the other day, like I had someone come, like they couldn't, the motor planning to move their leg was like, they would tap out at a certain time period. So like she was able to move her leg when she was told, but then all of a sudden, like she'd hit this level of fatigued and that motor planning just went downhill. And I'm like, I would have never attributed that to the concussion. But yeah. it, I mean, I believe it now. Like I see it so often in the clinic that I'm like, yeah, let's yeah. look at let's, right. let's try to figure out how to, fi- you know, fix it. Yeah, that is so something that I, I like I've seen as well and totally agree. Like there's so many things that it's like, why, why not? And I love that, that question. Like, why wouldn't it be? Let's, I think the piece of one of the things that people who come through the program say all the time is like, you guys, you get it you understand, like you, you believe me when I tell you what I'm experiencing and they don't, not everybody gets that from their doctors at home or their support systems at home. Like people, like you said, it it doesn't make sense necessarily. Like, why would it be? But if you think about it, like the brain is in charge of everything, <laughs> like the, the autonomic nervous system impacts everything. Like the, like you said, the rest and digest, the digestion, the heart rate, like people will tell me they just will randomly start sweating <laughs> because of this dysautonomia, like out yeah. of the blue, like sitting on a couch, watching a show, like nothing changed, but like the, the nervous system affects all the things. The brain affects all the things. Hormones can be out of um, whack because of it. Like there really, really is just so many things. And like, I remember somebody telling me that going in an elevator was very disturbing to them. Like it it would send off symptoms, set off symptoms for them. And again, that's another thing that somebody might be like, you can't ride an elevator. What that doesn't make sense <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. But but those those things really can be impacted. So I think, yeah, <laughs> for anybody I mean, listening out there, like you're not crazy. This could be real. Yeah. It's related. <laughs> and to the loved ones and support systems, like just believe them, at least be open mm-hmm. to the possibility that it could have been related and look into why, because it likely was. (laughs) Yeah, because I feel like most patients, they go off of, oh, well, here's your checklist of symptoms that you should have, right, Right. for concussion. But then they're like, well, I have all these other things. And then, well, am I just making this up? Or like, am I going crazy? Because people just don't believe that that's the case, like doctors or sometimes therapists, you know, because they're not as educated or they're not even open to the fact that, hey, yeah, like you said, the brain does so much. Why, why wouldn't it have that as a symptom? We don't know for sure. And so I think it's hard for patients to, to sit in that middle place where like, these are what the symptoms I should have, but this is what I do have. Mm -hmm. You know, do I even suggest that these are a problem because people have maybe laughed at me before, which is really sad, or they, they don't understand that side of it. So do I even offer up that symptom? And then it's kind of like, well, are we, are we like shutting people down? Because we're not open to the fact that there very well could be different symptoms for different people. And I, like I said, that's why I like cognitive effects, because I feel like they they are very, mo- all of the therapists are very open to even, even symptoms that are like, huh, I've never heard of that. But guess what? Let's look into it, right? Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. I love that. And when you were just saying that, it reminded me, I'm working with a client right now who has been going to vision therapy. And she was saying it was just like the first couple of visits were really, really, really hard and painful for her, which, you know, to some degree that's to be expected. Like vision therapy is hard. Um, those, as we were saying before, those visual systems, when they're not working properly, the process of getting them back can be, can be challenging, but really important. And once those are working again, it like can change all kinds of things, like cascade of positive things happening from it. But oh yeah. Um, but she, this was a, a teenager and her mom came with her finally on like the third session and had a conversation with the, the therapist that she was working with there. And, and the, the therapist was like, well, I've told her if she, when she, once she's dizzy and if she, once she feels dizzy and nauseous, we can stop. And, and her mom was like, those are not symptoms that she has. She's never going to tell you that she's dizzy and nauseous, but she's going to have this and this and this. So like, it really is so individualized and so important to be aware of like, what are the trigger symptoms for people? Like, what is, what are they experiencing? versus just like what are they supposed to have like what are you supposed to be looking for <laughs> exactly yeah no i i totally get that and and it's good for the ther- the mother to be like vouching for her and saying hey well she doesn't have these but she does have these and then the therapist is like oh okay that might be what's triggering you know that might be our stopping point yes. not nausea but another symptom is our stopping point so it's good for therapists to know too yeah, it's good for everybody and and really good to be taking rest breaks i'm just like pointing pointing out things from this conversation that are like hitting me like 
the rest breaks really are important. They make a really big difference. And so being aware of where you're at so that you can take those breaks is really important. But also, like you said, having her mom there is really helpful and having an advocate. Sometimes I know like the the client, the the teenager was like, at that point, my brain isn't working at all. I can't think straight. I can't communicate what is m- happening to me. Like, like you need, sometimes it, it is very helpful to have somebody in your corner <laughs> who can, who can articulate what's going on for you and, and help in that situation. So that caregiver support is so important. And yeah. so, yeah, anyone listening who is a caregiver or a loved one, you are very important. <laughs> so yes. um, this, is, this is important. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what we do to help people as OTs at Cognitive FX. Okay. So I guess, you know, like a typical session, you know, just to get night, like paint a picture would be, we, well, we kind of, <clears throat> I feel like we target a lot of multisensory. So we do a lot of multisensory activities. We look at, for me, I kind of look at the person's routine, their daily routine. You know, as OTs, I think we tend to look at people's roles. What what do they need to do in a day? Who are they? And we try to to base our, our ther- therapy off of those things because that's that's who they are. That's That's how they want to get better. And a lot of the goals that these patients come in to me with are, I want to be I want to be a better mother. I want to be able to read stories out loud to my kids. You know, again, I I can only read like a half a page to my kids. I want to be able to do those things. Like they're very, like, they're very important things, which is their role. So I tend to look a lot at those, like their goals, their roles, um, you know, jobs, what they kind of do, you know, um, at home or, or outside of home. And then I feel like we work a lot with vision as well. And mm-hmm. so to me, it would be like a, like a typical day. We we obviously work a little bit with a Brock string. I don't know if a lot of people on here are familiar with the Brock string, but it works for convergence, divergence. We tend to evaluate how the eyes are moving. So are they moving together? Are they jumpy? Are they not targeting right? You know, are they overshooting, undershooting? We also look at visual perception, which I think is different than some of the other uh, therapists. Um, kind of how how are how how is your brain interpreting what you see? And that's something that's always surprising for patients as well. Mm-hmm. We also, so with like the multisensory, I think we we tend to, we give people things, uh, multitasking a lot. So then they're, they're doing, you know, two, three, four things at the same time, which has actually been found to be very effective in creating pathways, right? And so I was there, OT sessions kind of result, revolve a, a lot around that where, where we're really having you do like multiple things at once, which sounds doesn't sound very fun, <laughs> but I mean, in, in some ways it can be fun if you go into it in a mentality of like, okay, I might not be great at this, but just throw it at me. Right. I'm, I'm going to be juggling all these things or wearing all these hats. <laughs> but in the end, those, that's how, how connections are established by those simultaneous uh, firing and activation of the brain, you create new pathways. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I love that. I would <laughs> think that's kind of how you sum it up. Is that kind of yeah, yeah. I would just add. Sometimes we, I like to share with people about the the importance of mindfulness and how impactful that can be for because a lot of time, like that can help with focus and attention, which is usually one of the big things people are dealing with, and also that emotional regulation, nervous system destimulation piece as well. Yeah. So both of like, I, if we have if we have time in the session, I like to to at least mention that important piece as well because they get they get all of these things from different sources throughout the week or weeks that they're there as well, which I think is really important. And part of why what CFX does is so effective is that you're getting it multiple times in a day, every day for like consistently broken up with periods of rest and like the physical activity. So like there's a combination. I love being part of this team that is like observing and able to see what people are, you know, we have different perspectives of what could be happening for this patient. And, and it's so nice to have it all in house. (laughs) It's all right here, which is, I think a very different experience than what a lot of people get when they're trying to piece together things at home and the therapists aren't communicating with each other. Like it can be, it's a, I feel like it's a unique and really wonderful thing that that can help people significantly. And something on that multi-sensory point, I was talking to somebody the other day and I had this like, I don't know, I feel like there's some good lessons to be learned from the the, the whole concept of this multi-sensory thing. <laughs> so the, the point, sometimes I'll have I'll, I'll like hold up some cards for some, for somebody. Like I love the spot it cards. Uh, it's a game called spot it, but I'll hold up cards and they have to find 
the match between the, like there's one, one picture that's the same between every two, every set of cards. And so I'll like hold up cards, but then I'll like start moving them around and then I'll have them like standing, like doing some balance activity. And then I'll be having music playing or something, some distracting <laughs> sounds in the background. And then I'll be having a conversation with them at the same time. <laughs> so I was like really like challenging all these different systems at once. And but the first thing I tell them is, okay, find the matching cards, <laughs> like find the match between these cards. And sometimes I've discovered <laughs> that sometimes people get really frustrated <laughs> when they can't find the match because they're doing all of these other things at the same time. And when we, when we tell people that, that higher purpose behind it, like the point isn't to find the match. The point is to engage all these different areas of your brain at the same time so that we're blocking the compensatory pathways that your brain has been taking so that it can take the proper pathways and like reestablish those proper connections. That's, that's the purpose of it. And when we, when they see the bigger purpose, then like, then the challenge is worth it. (laughs) Like it just, it's really interesting how a broader perspective and like not, not getting caught up in the, the details of the little things and the overwhelm of all of the things can just really make challenges feel more doable. <laughs> I think there's some like, good life application to that as well. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's, there's definitely things where I'm like the patient patient, like just the other day asked me, well, well, do I need to add some things when I'm biking? I'm like, well, you're outside biking, right? This is not a stationary bike. I'm like, no, let's don't add any more to that because that's already overstimulated and probably over, like a lot of sensory input to that. And I'm like, we don't need to add any more of that. <laughs> Yeah, you're good as it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and there are so many activities. Like and life will offer plenty of multisensory activities for people. Um, this this well. is true. Yeah, I know. I tell people all the time, that their kids, they're like toddlers, are their best therapists because they're going to give them plenty of visual stimulation and auditory stimulation, and like all yes. of this will be all up in like on them. <laughs> like they're, yeah, kids are. True. And you can never do one task without them there, right? If you ever yes. try to focus on anything, they're right there. They're there every time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so are there any um other like activities that you like to do with patients that you are your favorite things to do and how are they helpful for them? Well, I, I'm wondering, do you want me to be specific? I can be specific like on one activity that I really like yeah. and maybe the reasons. Um I, I really like implementing like a different approach for like so so putting people in like for Pilates, there's that bird dog position. If you're familiar with that, if not, it's it's getting like on your hands and knees and extending, you know, one hand out and then your opposite leg out. I really like that one because it puts your your body in a different position with space. So gravity kind of pulls at you differently when you're like in a you know a crawling position rather than an upright standing position. And so I kind of like that it changes that the vestibular system has to know where you are in space, so your brain has to adjust there. And then I usually give them a visual activity to do, Um, usually like a visual perception task. So if it's a a puzzle piece similar to like something similar to spot it to where they're having to to use their cicades, pursuits to find images or to, to create, you know, an image. So then they have to kind of grade the vision task, you know, like from something large to something small in their head. And then at the same time, all, uh, kind of offering them like a, a word retrieval activity. So they're having to listen to a word or a phrase and then be able to express it out loud at the same time. So they're doing those, you know, so for me, that's working the vestibular system. It's working visual perception and then also word retrieval at that one time. And then sometimes I'll actually throw in memory and say, okay, well, what did what did we you learn? What did I say in those last three cards? Right. And they're like, ah, I didn't know you were gonna make me do that. <laughs> but then, but you'd be surprised that some of them, because those things are activated, have started to like, oh, I didn't think I would remember that. But yeah, they can pull maybe one or two of those words or phrases out. Mm-hmm. And so it's fun. I mean, it, it kind of looks like a circus in there, you know, like patients doing all of these things. I know. <laughs> you know, and a lot of them don't think they can do it. And then the more we do th- these multi-sensory, you see it kind of opening up a little bit that they feel more capable. Like, uh, I don't know what the word is. Like they they can expand, like their brain can kind of expand to take in. Yes, the, the vestibular can take in more vision. I can be more aware of what's going on now, you know, after a little bit of more repetition of some of these multi-sensory activities. So 
That's one yeah. that I like to do a lot. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. It is pretty funny. I love to, when we're, when we're in the middle of these things where I'm like having people do like 20 things at the same time and it seems crazy. <laughs> it does look like a circus. I like to tell them my favorite therapy joke, which is what's the difference between a therapist and a terrorist? Do you know this one? Have I told you? I'm I know. I don't. Okay. The difference between a therapist and a terrorist is that you can negotiate with a terrorist. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> I have not heard that in all of my years in a profession. I'll take it. I have to, have to That's credit. actually perfect. <laughs> yeah. My my supervisor in my first like field work level two was uh yeah, she shared that with me and it's my favorite. <laughs> my favorite <laughs> joke. So you can start using it. I'm sure the patients will appreciate it in that moment. <laughs> I'm gonna do it and then I'm gonna quote you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's it is it's pretty funny, especially it it feels very apropos in those moments where I'm like telling them to do all these things and they're like, this is crazy. But you're right, they do like I love a lot of times. So sometimes that is very overwhelming, overstimulating, especially at the beginning of the week. But sometimes people say like are shocked that they feel better afterwards. And it is so cool to see like the brain engaging and like things starting to like come together and work better. It's it's pretty exciting. And I am gonna just throw out there too. This is at a clinic. It's a supervised activity. Like we, I want to, I want people to know that these things, like that it is possible for the brain to heal, <laughs> but just be, be careful. And I don't know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to say don't try this at home, <laughs> but be careful. And, and the best way to do this is to have, have professional eyes on you while you're doing these kinds of things who can help because, because up to this point, like at, at, in the clinic setting, we can control a lot of things. We're watching, we're making sure that you're, we're doing it safely and that we're taking those breaks when needed, things like that. There's a lot of supervision happening. And those kinds of activities, again, like people are so surprised that it works because prior to coming to this clinic and getting the combination of help from these different therapies in different ways, like that would totally set off symptoms and <laughs> have people like in bed for days. So like it's it feels weird and ironic that it's helping, but but because it's done professionally, it does make a difference. <laughs> yeah. With like, you know, with like a protocol too and, and and how you do things makes a difference, right? So like, like the steps, you know, like the whole activating your brain or your body and your brain and then rest, like that cycle is kind of how you should do things. And I feel like the, the therapists are able to, to kind of set that, that cycle or that routine for you. So or not, can also say, oh yeah, you probably need, you know, a little bit of rest or we should, we should back off on this a little bit. Yeah. So you're not just going home and doing a circus and then, whoa, I would just have all these symptoms. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is. It's, it's an important point to make, I think. So what advice do you have for people? I guess this kind of goes to that. Like if people are suffering from post-concussion syndrome and they might not have a chance to do an intensive treatment like CFX offers at this point in their journey. What kinds of OT tips and tricks can you offer as far as activities that they can do at home to manage and improve their symptoms? Oh, that's uh, interesting. So um, tips or tricks. I mean, obviously, you you don't want to follow, follow the, the, the standard or the protocol that was in the past. And hopefully it's changing now, but where you don't want to go in cocoon, right? Mm. So you don't really go in cocoon for like several days or weeks, as some people do, because it feels better. Tell us, tell us what cocooning is. Sorry, just throwing that. Oh, sorry. So cocooning would be like you just, and this is often what happens and probably how a lot of concussed patients feel at, right after their injury. They feel so horrible. They just go and sit like in a dark room where there's hardly any stimuli. So there's no no auditory, no visual stimuli, and they just sit there for a long time, sometimes the majority of the day. And that's not necessarily like they want you to be able to rest right after the injury for a couple days, two or three days where you're not really doing much. You're letting the brain kind of heal. Uh, but then after that, they, they really, we really recommend doing, you know, the activation again. So, so try and get back to normal life. You kind of want to ease your way into it, but you also want to do, you know, working various parts of your brain and getting that activation. Um, that was important. So, so cocooning would be opposite of that, right? Like you're not activating anything. You're just sitting there because it feels really good. <laughs> yes. yeah. Don't want to be too comfortable exactly. <laughs> after the first couple of days. You can for the first couple of days, but yes. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Anything else that comes? So what would I, yeah. What would I recommend? Well, 
I mean, I would, I would kind of recommend obviously starting there, like, like doing a little bit more of activation. So I would, for me, if I, let's say I didn't have a, a therapist and I didn't have, I couldn't afford to go to some of these amazing clinics. I would look at, okay, well, well, let's look at how many parts of the brain I can try and activate today. And it doesn't have to be that I do an entire hour. It could be that I maybe do 10 minutes. So I work mem memory as a part of a function of the brain, right? And I do a little bit of memory activities and then I kind of pay attention to how I feel. Okay, that was a little bit much. Maybe I'll just kind of stop there. You know, I would make sure that I'm still staying fairly active. So maybe I would go on a gentle walk to begin with. Getting, you know, outside, even though you might be light sensitive, would still be good for, for short periods of time, right? You just kind of want to to kind of do baby steps in the beginning, I think baby steps, but you're still looking at, okay, well, I need to do something, a little bit of attention. I'd like to focus a little bit on my vision um, and doing small segments of all of those is kind of where I would start. Mm, yeah. um, and I would just pay attention to how I felt, you know, if, if, if it was a little bit too much, then maybe the next day I cut back, but I would still very much try to, to, you know, activate, get some blood flowing to my body, to my brain, and then also do the necessary rest that you you'll run into a variety of patients, some that are like so gun ho that they overdo it. Right. And then you'll have some that just don't do it because they're like, oh, I'm afraid. I don't want to, I don't want to hit in that, that terrible place where I get triggered and fall apart. So mm -hmm. I feel like I have to give advice for both ends. <laughs> yes. So, so don't do too much obviously, but don't, don't not do anything. Right. would be kind of where I would stay right in the middle of just paying attention to my body, activating it a little bit through my, you know, like memory, logic, attention, doing a, like some of the vision activities. And you could probably even pull up some activities online for vision and just doing a few of those. And just, that's kind of where I'd start. And then obviously I'd take my rest breaks, which you know, in a way is being in a dark room and isolating yourself for a, a little while is actually healthy for the brain. Yeah. Um, just not the whole day. So yeah. that's kind of, that's kind of where I'd start. Is Love that, it. Yes. Is that yeah, no, that's doing? perfect. Thank you. And actually that brought up a bunch of things that I, makes me want to share as well. So thank you for, <laughs> thanks for sparking those in my mind. So kind of along the lines of what you're saying, the taking the rest breaks really is so important. It And it is a balance, right? Like you said, we don't, after the first couple of days, you do want to be out there. You do want to be like, pushing yourself, nudging yourself at least, right? Like we want to be moving the the dial forward a little bit, but carefully <laughs> and like baby stepping in. Um, and I think that that idea of pacing is really important. Like just pay attention to your symptoms, to how you're feeling and listen to your body. <laughs> don't, don't push it past. Um, yeah. You, there are consequences for pushing it too hard. So, and not dire ones. I'm not saying like, <laughs> you're not going to like re-injure your brain by pushing too hard, but there you may be in bed for a few days or whatever, like it can be very impactful. So, so pay attention to your body, prioritize the rest, like push a little bit, take a rest, push a little bit, take a rest. Sometimes it's good to be proactive and like set a timer, <laughs> like every hour I'm going to stop and like close my eyes, do some palming where you like kind of cover the eyes with the palms of your hands and just like de-stem, breathe, do some nice diaphragmatic breathing, slow inhale, but slower exhales, like just really like calm the system before moving on and then, but, but do move on. <laughs> um, and, and I, yeah, another plug for mindfulness, just cause I do love it. So much. I think it is such a helpful tool, just grounding in the present being in your body, um, can be so important because our brains and, you know, our minds like to go to the past and the future. And when they're out there, then our nervous system can get revved up more. But if we remind ourselves, okay, right now in this moment, I'm safe, I'm okay. <laughs> and like breathing, Connecting in with that, you know, your body, your senses, what's happening right now can be very calming and helpful. And like you were saying, as far as the visual stuff goes, I think some simple things that people could do just to maybe test, because like we said, you, you said this so beautifully, like we don't, under, we, a lot of times people come in, they don't even realize because they can see, they can see that light on the other side of the room just fine. They think they're okay, but the the challenges with different like eye tracking and, and virgins <laughs> issues. And so something you could do is like, pick a point in the far distance and then pick a point closer in closer to your body and just like jump your eyes back and forth between those or hold your finger out in front of your nose and slowly bring it in. See if your eyes can keep it at one finger until it gets to a couple inches away from your nose before it tries to split into two. So like playing with your eyes that way, just that could be a good just self-assessment. Like, okay, does this cause symptoms for me? If so, then maybe I should look into getting some more help with my vision and a simple balancing too. If you're like standing upright, you're good to go. That's great. 
What if you put your feet one in front of the other? Can you handle that? What if you close your eyes? Again, do this safely, please. <laughs> be <laughs> to the wall in case you need to catch yourself or have somebody there. But like you can, you can kind of get a feel for whether how you're doing. But again, having professional eyes on you is ideal. <laughs> but just want to give people some ideas of things that they can kind of get an idea for. And something to remember too, as you pointed out again, really well, like we don't want to tell people not to do anything, but we also don't want to tell people to just like go push and like do all the things. <laughs> it is, it is finding that balance and something that I was, I was doing a, a course that on, on balance on like neurological rehab kind of stuff. It was a Z health thing with Dr. Cobb. I don't know if you've done any oh, of those. Oh, yeah. yeah. So cool. So, so cool. Um, but he said something I had to like stop my, stop the video and like write it down. Cause it was very impactful for me. He said, balance is about recovery. And he was talking about physical balance. Like when you are, you know, if you're standing up and you can stand on one foot, that's great. But if somebody comes in and like nudges you, can you recover from that? Like that's, that's where, that's what real balance, helpful balance is functional balance is. And so that like, I just applied that to my life because I've, I always thought that there would be this point in my life where I had all of the balls perfectly like poised in the air <laughs> like everything was being balanced and like I could just like sit there and just be calm and still and I realized that that's not how life works <laughs> like there's always something <laughs> coming in and nudging and like pushing and the balance is about the recovery so it's okay if sometimes you you push a little too hard and then you have to swing back the other way and and rest a little too long <laughs> like it's okay to be to be in that flow because there's never complete stillness. <laughs> like it's, it's always going to be back and forth and movement. And so I think, again, life lesson here for me, <laughs> I really needed to hear at that point because I, yeah. No, that's, really a good, that's a good awesome. way of, I like that. That's a good way of like, like phrasing it, like about recovery. I've never looked at, I mean, in general, it really is about reco- balance is about recovery, but you also think, well, can I just stand there? But then the process of healing is like, oh, okay. If they do get nudged or they do get hit, it's the process of being able to recover the speed, the, the timing, the, the ability. Like I'd never looked at it quite that way. So that's no, like that. brilliant. Right? Uh, Dr. Cobb, he's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I really did love that too. And, and just kind of as yeah, a broader perspective of like, we're, we're constantly, it's a flow, it's an ebb and flow and it's okay that it's like that. So don't get down on yourself if it's not looking exactly like you want <laughs> linear progress, <laughs> like perfect stillness, whatever, like it's going to be, it's going to be a mess and that's okay. <laughs> we're, we're just figuring, we're all figuring it out along the way. So true, um, I agree. <laughs> so are, are there any resources that you like to point people to as they're to get more info or help with concussion related concerns? Well, obviously, I mean, I don't know if we brought up that or going into the, the cognitive, uh, well, it's a home therapy for concussions. Uh, the tool that I created obviously would be one that I would recommend because obviously I created it and I believe in it. Yeah. Uh, so I think we'll talk about that in a little bit, but that's a, a great resource to me. Neuro ophthalmologists are a great resource, but I, I don't know if I would actually go and pay the money initially until I, you know, kind of looked into like, well, okay, well, what might be some of the problems, you know, is, am I having a hard, like, am I having some of the headaches after vision? Is it difficult to read? Is driving difficult? Like, so I start to see some of those symptoms of vision. Then I would say, yeah, let's go get, you know, just an evaluation of a neuro you know, ophthalmologist, um, specifically one that works with your brain. I mean, you don't want to go just to any eye doctor, right? Um, Yeah. Can I throw out there then the, the website I think is covd.org, I believe. And it's, uh, you want to check the box that says board certified. (laughs) So that will help you find, like you can locate a neuro optometrist (laughs) near you that does focus in on concussion stuff that can be really helpful. So yeah, yeah, thank you. That's So, I mean, I would, I mean, that's always going to be a great resource. I feel like there, there's a lot of educational books out there too, that are good resources. I, I, I really like, um, I mean, but I don't know if reading is going to be the thing you're going to want to do, but yeah, I, the, the brain that heals itself, that was a fascinating book to me uh, that, you know, to me kind of is summarizes a lot of the processes that we use in our therapy. And so like just having that mindset from the book and all the research he's conducted would be a good resource. Like if you're kind of stuck on like, well, well, what can I kind of do at home and and why am I doing this, you know, to begin with? (laughs) Then, I mean, there's obviously, you know, other therapies too, like 
I mean, it just depends on the, on the the money that you do have, I think, um, and the time that you do have to be able to put into it. There's like smaller like outpatient clinics too that might maybe help with you know the vestibular system balance, or they could specifically help with some of the vision too. You know, rather than you know going in and paying a lot for some other really expensive clinics, but you know, I feel like you could see how well you do up until that point. And then if you obviously need more help and you have, you've kind of run into a wall, then obviously I would obviously recommend, you know, like a, a place like Cognitive FX where they are expensive, but they have phenomenal results. Yeah. You know, I know I tell people I've worked there for seven years and I like pinch myself every time I go, I'm like, I hear the stories of people, like the changes that they make within that week, but then continuing, like there's, it's, it's so inspiring <laughs> and yeah, it really can make a huge difference. So yeah. beautiful. I love those. And I'm going to just make it the, the book that you referenced is actually called the brain that changes itself. And then there's one called the brain's way of healing. And that's, there's two books by Norman Doidge. And it's cool because at the end of, I think the brain's way of healing is the second one. And in the appendix, at least in the physical copy of it, not the audio book, but in the appendix of it, they actually mention our clinic cognitive effects because it's oh, like, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But those, yeah, those two books, I remember when I listened to them, I would like listen to it on my drive to and from work and I would come home and just like burst through the door and be like, Thane, everybody needs to read this book. Thane, Thane, Thane. Like, yeah. it's, the brain is the coolest thing in the world. So um, yeah, really fascinating, really interesting books. So <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. Thank but, you. And I feel like it gives you a lot of hope because it's it's research-based, right? He goes through these scenarios of research that you may not feel like they apply like you know like i remember something with like a monkey you know where they cut off one of the monkey's fingers which you know i know is, is sad it's like that i'm a, i'm an animal person so i was like ah but then like the whole point was showing like the improvement or how the brain changed from that motor cortex mm-hmm. from the finger in the, it changed to another location to be able to function and it was just so, it was so cool to me. Like it for, for, you know, for somebody who has a concussion, I can see how this book would give you hope, mm-hmm. you know, hope that, yeah, the bla- the brain is plastic. It can change. It can, you're not stuck like this forever, but let's do some of these things to see if we can make those changes and it'll be hard. Yeah. And it, there'll be some time that you have to put into it, but it'll be worth it. You yeah. know, yes. uh, for me, it was very hopeful and, and exciting as a therapist to, to read it. So. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I love that you brought it up. I appreciate that. And yes, we are definitely going to get to hear about more, more about your product that you've created. So I'm excited to do that. But before we jump there, do you have any advice, um, things that you've observed about how caregivers or support system of people suffering concussions can best help their loved one? Well, that one's tricky. Uh, I think number one would be to try to be understanding, to not jump to, you know, like, I guess, I guess to one, maybe acknowledge, acknowledge what they're going through. I think a lot of patients, they just, they just want to be heard. They want to know that what they're feeling, you know, as, as the caregiver, you don't know exactly what they're feeling, but to try to have as much empathy as you can for their situation. I think that would be a great place to, for them to feel heard and try to be understood. Um, and then for, you know, the other, other aspects, you know, be a support, you know, try to help them find things that could be beneficial in their recovery, give them the time they need to heal, but also kind of be their coach, be their, their cheerleader on the side, you know, that's helping them push through difficult things. And also the, the voice in their heads that says, okay, let's, let's stop for a little bit. Let's, let's take a break. You know, I feel like a caregiver would be, I mean, that would be like the ideal caregiver, you know, someone who you know is supportive, understanding, empathetic, and also helps you, it, like, guy helps to guide and find ways. Like, I don't know how many patients come in to the cognitive and they're like, oh, yeah, it was my mom that found this for me. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Like, yeah. there's so many people, like, these, these these caregivers, they love their, they love these people so much. They mm-hmm. want, they want to see them back to who they were before you know, and they, they, I feel like they're hurting just as much as, you know, the, the people that have the concussion and, mm-hmm. and they, they go and they search and they, they do all of these things. And I think that's perfect. I think having somebody on your side, on your team, you know, when you're going through something hard like this, that not everybody can see is going to be the biggest thing for a caregiver. Yeah. Thank you. That is, I love that you brought that up too. Cause yeah, there I so many times I'll while I'm making them look for the the matching card and balancing and all of the things, one of the things I love to ask people is like, how did you find CFX? How did you come to this clinic? And 
so many times it's, oh, my, my mom, my spouse, my sister, my, my somebody either has gone here and told me about it, or they were searching for, for help for me. And yeah. that's, yeah, it can make a really big difference. But I love also that you brought up the being a cheerleader, I think helping people sell up, see and celebrate the wins, even if they're small, like that hope of like, oh, hey, look, I did make some progress. I did something good happen today. Like that can be huge for the mental and emotional components. And and that mental emotional component is a significant part of recovery. Like we we need to have that hope. We need to know that what we're doing is is making a difference. And if, yeah. even if it's a small difference, like that can be a really big deal. And like you said, cue to rest, cue to push, <laughs> like having somebody to bounce off yeah. that is really important. And I, I always want to throw out there too, that the loved one needs to be taking care of themselves so that they can be in a position to do that. Cause I think everybody wants to do that, but sometimes it can be very challenging to be a caregiver and it can be really ch- on top of all the rest of life things, right? Like, so just give yourself a lot of grace through the process and love and support them the best you can and love and support you <laughs> as well. So exactly. Yeah. So important. You don't Thank want you. to get so ingrained that you don't take care of yourself either. And then, then you have two people that are like in the house that are like, Oh, <laughs> we're not stuck in this hole and we can't get out, you know, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> important, both of them. I agree. Yeah. All right. Let's hear about this amazing cognitive box of joy that you created. <laughs> hey, I need, I need to promote it as box of joy. <laughs> Why didn't I do that to begin with? Dang it. <laughs> it You're so much better than cognitive efficiency tool, right? <laughs> <laughs> so much better. <laughs> um, credit for it, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the, the title is cognitive efficiency tool, you know, obviously because the goal is to create an efficient brain. We all want to be more efficient in our, you know, our actions and our thoughts and, and how the brain actually functions, you know, to be whether you're have a concussion or even, you know, feel like you're aging and you feel like I'm not as sharp or as quick as I used to be in my thoughts and my actions and even movements for that matter. But yeah, it's, um, it's based off of cognitive effects, like protocol where, you know, I, I actually started this with, with Dr. Fong. We were just talking about it. And in the beginning, it was like to create like a post care tool. Mm -hmm. something that patients could leave the clinic with and have like a physical box instead of like a screen that they had to look at for light sensitivity. And uh, like, we live in a, in a world of screens. And so let's, let's create something physical. Um, And she liked it. Like I was bouncing off these ideas with her and like, Hey, you know, we we recommend all these games that people do and they end up spending $300 on games Mm -hmm. and let's create something let's let's pull those games out yeah they can still be fun but let's pull the therapy out of those games and make it the goal is therapeutic right instead of just for fun the goal would be to like obviously heal and and help the brain become more efficient and so you know we i worked with her a little bit and we kind of problem solved like how we would start this how we would use it cognitive fx is using it as a post-care tool so they you can buy it at the clinic and and uh, take it home with you. But basically what it does is it has, you know, works several parts of the brain, as many parts, like the goal for me was to work as many parts of the brain as you can. And then it it creates, it has like in the workbook, it'll have, I'm so sorry, maybe I'll, I'll start again, but it has cards, it has a workbook, it has some puzzle pieces. It has, you know, the, lo- the lovely Brock string that everyone loves. <laughs> Um, and then it has some tear outs that you can put on your walls at home to do a lot of your home therapy. Obviously there's some, some cautionary verbiage in there that makes sure like if somebody, if you do have some balance issues, we want to make sure that somebody's with you, a caregiver, which would be another way a caregiver could support. (laughs) Um, but basically it's just, it's, it's something that I wanted to create as a post-care tool, but also for people that couldn't come into the clinic. So I actually adapted it when I was in the middle of doing this because my initial thought was, oh, post-care patients, patients that have gone through the therapy and now I can give them this box and they understand it. I actually changed it when I was going through because I'm like, I want this to be for people that can't afford cognitive. Yeah. Expensive and not everyone can. I mean, I would say, yes, cognitive is going to be your best resource no matter what. If I had to choose, that's just... But what about those people that can't? They're struggling. There's a lot of people that struggle, struggle because they can't afford, you know, thousands of dollars to go to these clinics. And and so I changed it and I we we changed to adapt the words. So it's 
you can do this basically on your own. The, the workbook has all of the education. It has how to do things. It has what to look for. It has multi-sensory tasks for every therapy activity that we have you do. And so it'll combine, you know, like memory or it'll combine. So, so like, let's say you wanted to work a memory activity. You can pull out a card that has memory. And then the multi-sensor that we've created in the workbook that tells you is, hey, let's let's add this. Let's add tossing a ball. Let's add some auditory. Um, and so we, we've created the book in itself is very multi-sensory. And so we're, we're, we're really targeting the pathway creation, right? Of like targeting different parts of the brain in one activity at the same time. And so all of, all of the, the activities, you know, the therapy activities and the cards and the workbook are all built around that protocol of uh, multi-sensory working as many parts of the brain as you can in one day. Obviously, there's a routine in there that says, hey, you want to start by activating your body by exercise and you want to activate your brain by some of these activities are included in the box and then obviously take your rest break. So it follows and it, it kind of tells you as if you had never been to a therapy clinic you could probably pick this workbook up, read through it and follow the activities. We've made it very user friendly mm -hmm. for that fact that maybe you don't have the the education of going through two weeks at cognitive effects and learning, right? But you yeah. could pick it up and you could see, hey, this is making improvements. I'm doing better. You know, like I, like just by doing some of these activities, I mean, we do recommend, you know, like like 30 to 60 minutes of exercise of, of activating the brain and the rest in the book, but it's kind of, you can, you can change and adjust. So you can do a big cycle or you can do mini cycles throughout the day. So let's say you do have work that gets, you know, or life that gets in the way, right? <laughs> you can't just do therapy forever, but little mini cycles of activating the body, activating the brain, and then taking a rest and mm -hmm. shortening that time throughout the day to fit into your schedule. So to me, I think it's a wonderful resource. Obviously, I spent a lot of time <laughs> and a lot of energy, but it was it's mainly for people that maybe can't afford it. And then also to support some of the the patients at Cognitive FX that leave and just want something physical instead of having to sit and think, okay, well, what did I learn in the clinic? Or what did, like what did they tell me to do? They have a box and the box just tells them what to do. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many patients have been like, I just want something to tell me what to do because I'm so tired of thinking. <laughs> yes, yes, so, so true. Or I don't have the memory that I had by coming to cognitive effects. And I just I just need something that I can take and I can open up on those days that are hard. And I I know that I'm still I'm still improving because I'm still doing some of those activities in the box. Yeah. And I love that you like made it. Yeah. Rather than have to go and like find all the different games that we recommend, they're like, Hey, this is good. This is good. Like it's all there in one piece. Like I, I yeah. Love and it tells you exactly what you're working. Like it'll tell you, okay, we're working visual memory. Oh yeah. I that, that was working visual memory, you know, like the normal person that's not, you know, a therapist or even have any health background may not know, you know, what working memory is. Like I didn't know initially what working memory was. So it, it like lays it out. It'll say, okay, okay, today I want to work, work, I want to do working memory or tomorrow I want to work a logic task or, you know, I'm going to do this one back to back and then I'm going to be done for the day. So it's nice because it tells you basically what you're working, how to do it. And then the whole protocol or the mindset behind what you're doing. So yeah, I love it. And I do really like that part too, that it's like, you can, you know why you're doing it, like what good it's doing for your brain, which is really a cool piece. Um, again, yes. that, that why that bigger picture of why we're doing this thing makes a really big difference. So I love, yeah. love, love that. So how can people get a hold of one? And I know some of our audience is international. Is this available outside of the U.S.? It is. Yeah. Um, the only hard part with international, of course, is shipping costs. You know, sometimes it's it can be anywhere from 40 to 80, depending on where you're going. But it's definitely international. Our website, it's um, obviously www.mindspark. So M-Y-N-D-S-P-A-R-K dot com. And so if you hop on there, you can actually order it. It does have you know, international shipping just tends to be a little bit more expensive on that side, but you can, you know, usually get the box within, you know, internationally two to three weeks, just depending on where you're headed and, you know, customs and that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, in the U S it could be there in like, you know, three to five days, normal shipping time. So. Yeah, we can, if you want to send me that, I'll put it in the show notes. So the, I'll put, I'll put all of this in the show notes. So if you're interested in getting one, check out the show notes, mindspark.com with a mind with a Y. 
And yeah, getting a coupon code, I think would be great for them, for people. Yeah. Then we can give you a coupon code for those that are listening to your podcast and you can check it out that way. It'll give you a discount um, through like the checkout process in the website. So do the card. Yay. Awesome. Thank you. I think that I'm, I'm excited. I really do feel like this would be helpful for people because again, it is, it is kind of mirroring what we do at CFX, which we both have just described how much we love it and what a difference it makes for people. So, but just like knowing what resources are out there and how to best help people care for their brains is really important. So love what, love that you've done this and it's awesome and amazing. Um, and is there, is there anything else you'd like people to know about concussions or how they can improve or speed up their recovery journey or just anything, anything you want the world to know? I guess, you know, to leave on a, a good optimistic note that you're talking to two therapists here that have seen so many patients go through this process and it's a hard process and it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of patience and care for yourself. Sorry, I'm going to get teary yet, <laughs> but like the, you know, leave on a good note would be that there is hope, you know, that the, whew, the changes in life that you experience and the, you know, the, the ups and downs that concussion can bring and to you and to your loved ones too. That there is hope. Like like I see it on a daily basis. And that's that's the best thing for me as a therapist. But also it's nice to hear it from someone who sees so many people that have concussions. Yes, it, it is possible. We're not just telling you that to get you to come to the clinic or to buy this wonderful tool. But like we see the progress. We see the change in people's lives. We see the that there is something that can actually start helping concussions now. And and previous to this, we just thought, hey, it's something you have to live with. And sometimes dark doctors these days will tell you, hey, just live with it. I get that all the time. It's normal. You're just gonna have to change and adapt. And I'm like, no, let, let's it, it there's so much research now. And and think I'm so grateful for those people that have dedicated their lives to to trying to research this and improve it and actually know that, hey, there's hope at the end of this tunnel. There's light. You can get there. It might take a little bit of time. Yeah. The brain is is hard to t- try to change sometimes, but doing it the right way, you can get back to being the person you want to be. You can have those decrease in symptoms. You can be the mom that reads to their children. You can be the dad that doesn't have to shut the door all of the time because he can't tolerate the sound from their kids um, or be able to work and, and go back to the job that actually gave them so much happiness and hope because they were successful at they can do those things and and not have to shut themselves out from society because it's too noisy or it's too overstimulating you don't have to be a hermit anymore so like to me that's that's what i would like to end it on (laughs) is more so that there is there's hope there's hope for you just keep keep going that's that's perfectly said thank you and like amen to all of that that is exactly how I feel and how I like the purpose of this podcast. Like I, I really, really appreciate you sharing that because that is, that's what people need to hear. And yeah. And I love that we can share as many resources as we can, like to help you get there, but just do know that it is possible. Don't stop searching. <laughs> so exactly. thank you. You're welcome. I'm so glad you listened in today. I hope you've gained some helpful insights and inspiration regarding dealing with and recovering from concussions. My goal is to create more awareness and education about concussions and the fact that there is so much that can be done to improve life after someone has had one. Help me spread the message by liking, commenting, rating, and subscribing to this podcast and share it with others who would benefit from hearing it. There are more resources available on my website. And again, if you or someone you love would benefit from concussion coaching, sign up for a free consultation using the link in the show notes or at my website, www.theconcussioncoach.com. Thank you. See you next time and take good care of that amazing brain of yours.